Lawyers of Reddit, how do you argue without crying? Story 1. It's less about crying from the running the case argument, and more about the stress and sadness of the subject matter. But for the most part, cases aren't two lawyers having a heated argument with each other. They're just factual legal submissions, often aggressively delivered, to try convince a judge or jury to favor their side. Story 2. The only cases I've cried were two pro bono asylum cases I worked on. Pro bono is like volunteer work. One was tears of joy, the other very much tears of sorrow. And regarding the arguing bit, I don't work in an emotional area of law. Sure, I've worked hard to craft my arguments to their strongest point possible. But at the end of the day, whether I win or lose my client is still likely going to be insanely rich. No one's rights have been trampled. It's tough to get super attached in my cases. Also, most of my arguing has already been done on paper multiple times. So I have an idea how all parties will be reacting ahead of time. Story 3. I was on a jury once in a murder case. The accused had the odds stacked against him, but in the end the prosecutor just couldn't push things over the beyond a reasonable doubt hurdle, and we acquitted the accused man. The guy had a female public defender for a lawyer. When the verdict was read, she broke down and cried. She had worked hard for her client, but I don't believe even she thought she would get him off. All of us jurors felt that the guy actually probably did do it, the prosecutor's case just had too many holes. We all agreed that we felt like we needed to go home and take a shower. Story 4. In civil cases, contract disputes, personal injury, there isn't much to cry over. It's mostly paperwork. I do a fair bit of family litigation, and there isn't really a good guy versus bad guy. It's always shades of gray. The system works best, and the law develops properly when each side brings their best arguments on the evidence. People get emotional in family law, especially custody, but it's not your problem. You simply work with the facts your client has and advance the best argument you can. Story 5. I self-repped in family court during a very bitter divorce custody battle. My ex was doing everything she could to ruin my relationship with my kids. One thing we had was baseball. I coached their little league games. My daughter, Nanyo at the time, is smaller than most kids her age. Terrible at bat. Nervous about everything. I worked with her a lot and built up her confidence. Finally, one game she connected with the ball and made it to first base. Next batter, she got to second. Next batter, she got to third. Next batter, she crossed home. My shy, quiet daughter was a completely different person as she celebrated her first baseball run. And her mother chose to keep her away from all her baseball games when the kids were with her just to spite me. Telling the story of my daughter's first baseball run in court, it was impossible to hold back my tears. Even the court clerk was in tears. I eventually got a court order that her mom had to get her to all her little league games. Story 6. Arguing during litigation is different from just arguing. You're focused on remembering the law, listening to what's being said and argued on the other side and formulating a response. Because it's your job to do so, there isn't much room to be emotional. I save the crying for my office, car, shower, pretty much anywhere but the courtroom. Story 7. Practice. When you start doing audiences is hard, but with time you became used to it. It's funny. To me, the feeling is almost like to separate myself of what I'm doing. It's a form of blinding myself. But at home, later... Depending of the thing is hard, I have some cases that are still hunting me years after what happened, especially in what concerns family law. Story 8. A lot of comments seem to gloss over what I perceive as an important part of the OP's question. How do lawyers cope with constant confrontation, adversarial relationships, questioning of one's character and honesty, being told you're being unreasonable, etc.? Some areas of law have less of this. If you're a transactional lawyer, you have disagreements with the other parties, but everyone's trying to get to the same place and make a deal happen. Many criminal cases may not be particularly adversarial either. Most end with a plea bargain that is just a negotiation over the charges and the strength of the evidence, without any real dispute, A, to the underlying facts. For example, you're caught on camera stealing or a K-9 found sweets in your car. Working with regulatory agencies can be similar. You might just be working with a bureaucrat to make sure the forms get filled out right. Family law is among the worst. It's insanely emotional, and every aspect of every case is a bitter fight to the death. Want an extension of 48 hours to file your brief? Go to hell. Immigration asylum cases are similar. Everything is wrapped in human tragedy. Many criminal cases are extremely hard on the lawyers, as folks have detailed in this thread. But even run-of-the-mill cases with an unemotional subject matter can take a heavy toll on the lawyer. Even if you do something boring, or that's just paperwork like patent law or contract disputes, your relationship with opposing counsel can make it grueling. 
I've had lawyers accuse me of lying, withholding documents, treat me suspiciously, yell at me, call me unprofessional, question my intelligence, question my ethics. To my face, over the phone, via email, in court, on the record, in depositions, you name it. I've been compared to Hitler. How do lawyers cope? In my experience, a lot of them drink. As many as one in five lawyers is a problem drinker, twice the national rate. I've seen a lot of folks take out the stress on their families, but the divorce rate among lawyers as a whole is lower than you'd expect. Candy abuse is much more common than you'd think for folks who have an ethical and professional obligation to be law-abiding citizens. In my personal life, I am not a confrontational person, and I pride myself on making people feel welcome, being able to talk to anyone at a party comfortably, making polite small talk with strangers, and generally being a nice, laid-back, agreeable dude. At work, I have to put on a different persona of someone who is thick-skinned, callous, professional, robotic. If I have a confrontational call, I'll need to take time to calm down and recenter myself. If I have a rough deposition or day in court, I have to exercise or meditate to purge it, or it will ruin my evening. Sometimes I can't open important emails after business hours because if I do, it will ruin my family time and my evening or my night of sleep. I've dealt with panic attacks my whole life, never in court, always after. There's no off button or truly off the clock in my job. It is a constant daily struggle to keep the stress and emotions in check, and for me, it's impossible to be perfect at stopping myself from taking things personally. Story 9. Keep in mind, even if we get contentious in that courtroom, we walk right out and shake hands with opposing counsel and discuss plans to get our families together. It's not an emotional form of argument, usually. It's a job and we usually use reasoning. If it looks like emotional argument, usually the emotional part is a performance, like being in a play to get the result we want. You cannot equate it with arguments you have in your daily life. Story 10. For me, the reason I don't cry while arguing is simple. The process isn't meant to be adversarial. I hate arguments where it's personal and confrontational, and that is usually what makes people cry. You go, make your case, present your research on legal precedent, and how it ties into the facts of your case, and hope the judge understands what you meant to say and agrees. Also, the nerves anxiety of putting your point across well, and not sounding stupid or unprepared, has been a really intense factor for me. And the feeling of being on the spot takes over and doesn't leave room for any other emotions. Story 11. Family lawyer here? Personally, I often express frustration with tears and disagreements in my day-to-day -day life. Professionally, this frustration manifests normally since it usually stems from annoyances and ridiculous tactics used by other lawyers. I often find it amusing when an opposing counsel uses personal attacks and ridiculous tactics because I'm just dumbfounded by the approach. It is incredibly rare to get into a back-and-forth heated argument with an opposing counsel or party. When it does happen, it's usually in the hallway during a break or before submissions are made. My usual response is to distance myself as these kinds of discussions are not productive and are actually a disservice to the client if we engage. I can say that I have been given some very poor decisions by judges in different applications. These have usually been related to protection orders, domestic violence, or when a judge refuses to actually read the materials provided, having already made their mind up about the decision. I have had to fight back an emotional response numerous times in front of a judge after learning the hard way at the very beginning of my career that disputing a decision made by a judge in front of said judge will cause them to get quite upset with you and potentially tarnish their view of you for future cases of yours. We never know when we will be in front of the same judge again, so mastering your emotions in that room is paramount to your future success and frankly your reputation if you are presenting in an open court in front of other lawyers, the public, your client, and possibly their family. This is a learned response that becomes second nature with time. Outward expressions of frustration, sadness, defeat. These are generally shown to our friends, spouses, and co-workers at our firms only. People pay us to stay solid. Don't get me wrong, I've cried with a client less than a handful of times based on the heartbreaking nature of the situation. Abduction, abuse, etc. Time and a place, though. Story 12. I would think it's largely related to being prepared. A lot of times we get emotional BC, we're unprepared, surprised, etc. I imagine by the time you're in court, you're focused on the goal and the argument and the emotion is directed. You've spent so much time with the information, it's largely lost its emotional value. Even during questioning, etc., you've likely played out possible responses. And you need to be so engaged in the words and looking for openings that you're just thinking more than feeling. Story 13. A lot of lawyers were in debate clubs and societies 
and have developed the skills necessary for arguing points. I look at it that you are an attorney, which is derived from the French word for advocate. You're not there for you. You're there for your client. You're not you. You're a bad peach officer of the court, empowered to a vast degree beyond the average citizen. In fact, lawyers are so powerful that we must be constrained by ethical and professional rules. Story 14. I practice family law, divorce, and most of the crying was done early in my career, ranged from just seeing the suffering, to being yelled at by a judge, to not being able to digest the result from a hearing, to not knowing how to cope with the stress, to being triggered by some of the stories. Then it went from crying and insomnia and anxiety to just insomnia and anxiety. Finally, I started working with a counselor and that changed everything. I learned to set better boundaries and still care, but not at the expense of my own well-being. I learned to communicate and better support clients because I understood my own trauma and trigger points. Then I went and became a certified collaborative family lawyer and mediator because I wanted to help as many families I can outside of the court process because the court process should only be reserved for a small percentage of situations. My counselor changed the course of my life. As I was scrolling down the comments, I saw something about lawyers not having a soul. You would not believe how many people go into law because they want to make a positive change in the world. However, the process of becoming a lawyer and then gaining experience as a lawyer, sigh, that on top of very little time, basically none in the education and training spent on self-care, communication, and how to deal with compassion fatigue, many lawyers are burnt out without realizing. Many people simply disassociate in these circumstances as a coping mechanism. Story 15. Most of the time it's debate club. It's not personal in court and shouldn't be personal between lawyers in their correspondence. Lawyers who are rude in correspondence are pretty clearly acting tough for their client or are known assholes, and we just roll our eyes when we get snotogram. The real tough arguing that can result in crying is when we fight with our own clients and their parents because they're being stupid and lying to us, not providing disclosure, not taking a reasonable position, insisting we be rude to opposing counsel, when that's actually never helpful, insisting that we make arguments that make us look stupid in court. Story 16. I practiced criminal defense law, including many trials. I would be keyed up for the trial enough that the performance anxiety would just stomp out any other potential emotion. After trial was usually just waves of relief, the trial went okay or elation if I won. Not much of a crier in general, but there was one sentencing where I watched an 18-year-old woman get an heartbreakingly long prison sentence over some dumb candy-related thefts. That made me made me cry into a bottle of vodka. Story 17. Law attracts analytic people, ambitious people, psychopathic people, especially in disputes work rather than transactional. Often litigators are just not that inclined to cry in an argument. It is also much easier to advocate for someone else rather than yourself. Lawyers do cry, but it's less from arguing and more from being yelled at by a partner or judge, maybe a client if you're very junior, or out of sheer frustration. Story 18. I like to remind myself that the first person to get emotional, angry, upset, etc., usually loses. You just can't think as clearly when you have all kinds of hormones churning from the stress. So the first goal is to check your emotions before things get started. If I'm annoyed with opposing counsel, I will sometimes do a mini mindfulness exercise. Just take a sec to remember that my goal is to get my client the best result possible and that getting emotional, or getting opposing counsel emotional, won't help accomplish that. Story 19. Emotions are worthless unless you're using them to sway a jury. Judges see crazy cow all the time. They will focus on the facts of the case and apply it to relevant law. If you, as the attorney, can do the same, you will most of the time win. If you have a grieving family because some unpleasant person drunk drove into their mother-father, you need them to win and not cry scream in front of the judge or opposing lawyer. Story 20. Easier to stay objective and emotionless when exchanging written arguments, which is how 90% of litigation proceeds these days. At pretrial, you're limited for time, so no complex arguments are made, saved for later. Most of the time, you rely on the judge understanding the written material, and you add context flavor detail to what you've written. At mediation, it's basically the same thing, but you're allowed some rebuttal. The key here isn't your arguments, but managing your own clients. Assuming they are present, they can and tend to be boiling kettles of emotion and confusion. Again, you rely on prior written statements, refer to documents, 
and hold the mediator's hand through the process in the hope the other side will see your point of view to some extent. I've never cried or shed a tear during any litigation, but I have laughed myself into pain from reading statements so stupid, banal, unnecessary, circuitous, or frivolous that I had to walk away from my desk for a while. Story 21. By being professional, you are there to do a job that you've been trained to do, hired to do, are paid to do, need to do. The intellectually of giving the best possible representation to your client is drilled into your brain, and crying is counter to that. Also, as you become more experienced, you become jaded used to it. The human brain can get used to anything. My wife is kind, caring, compassionate, and cries when watching violent movies. She is also an incredible nurse, who doesn't bat an eye at horrible things that would break other people down. I've cried at some of the stories she's told me of her day at work, yet she doesn't bat an eye. Why? Because she is a professional and is used to it. This isn't to say she hasn't cried at work, but it's rare. Interestingly, even after all the crazy cow she's dealt with, dealing with the COVID cases were much more difficult, and crying became more frequent. Story 22. I do criminal defense. A case is just a set of facts and a person who is accused of doing those facts. Even on real poor cases, burned baby. I know there's someone else in charge of being mad about a burned baby. That's not my job. So I'm just focused on the client and evidence. Clients being poor to me upsets me sometimes. I can honestly say I've flipped off my cell phone during a phone call at least once this week. But they don't make me cry. Frustration during an argument with a prosecutor or judge doesn't really upset me as much anymore emotionally. I have a few attorney friends who I call and vent to. I can vent to my dad or husband. I have been out by a judge more than once. After a time and a lot of cases, this happens in a career. I've felt embarrassed for my stupid motion in the moment. Results of cases are probably the hardest. Seeing a guy being led away to do his three years of prison and advising him to hold his head up and not cry so that his mom isn't extra worried about him is kind of tough. And it might be inappropriate, too. I don't know. The clients don't bother me as much as their family does. Clients, kids, moms, finance, apparently no one is married. That bugs me. Story 23. I'm a lawyer, and literally everything makes me cry. Like commercials, songs, feel-good BuzzFeed lists, anything. And, like, ugly cry at that. For some reason, though, being in a courtroom just hits different. It's like you tap into another part of your brain entirely, and you become a fighting robot. And then when you get to your car, you can cry there. Story 24. I've honestly never felt heated or emotional arguing in court. I have, however, lost my temper while arguing with clients or prosecutors in private. If you're going to cry when you argue, might as well not be a lawyer. Or have random crying jags every few months when the stress of your job and all the confrontation really gets to you and don't tell anyone about it and bottle it up inside like I do. Story 25. If it's not a productive argument, walk away. If it is a productive argument, then you just need to understand that, A, you might be wrong. I think what most often makes people tear up, etc., is cognitive dissonance. They're wrong and they just can't accept it. B, this argument is about arriving at the correct decision, not arriving at your decision. I'm not a lawyer, but I like to argue. Politics, economics, work. We should do this. No, we should do this. You name it. So many people describe arguing as upsetting, exhausting, etc. I never understood that. As long as it is a productive argument, it's about something important, everyone is acting in good faith, it's a beneficial interaction for all parties. If I'm wrong, my positions get better. If I'm right, my arguments get stronger and I get better at delivering them. Win-win either way. I adopted a lot of my current beliefs by being proven wrong in arguments. It felt bad at the time, being wrong stinks. But it made me stronger. People who avoid arguing like the plague become super weak at defending their beliefs and become liable to losing confrontations with people, even when the other person is wrong. I have seen flat earthers absolutely roundhouse round earthers, aka normal, correct people, simply because the round earthers never bothered to argue their position before, which means, a, they're not equipped, b, the reasons they hold their beliefs are actually stupid, more stupid than why the flat earther believes what they believe. If you believe the earth is round, because all the greatest minds say so, or everyone else does, then in the 1200s, you'd have believed the earth was flat. Congratulations. I can prove the earth is flat. It is easily provable with a stick and a piece of string. People who hold minoritarian beliefs are often very strong arguers, even if they are wrong. They're used to the adversity of holding a minority belief and defending it. Hottest fire, sharpest steel and all. People who hold majoritarian beliefs are very often super weak arguers because they never have to argue. Reddit is a great example of this.
Dissent is buried in downvotes. The way to get better at arguing, I'm sorry, is to argue. It is a muscle you work out. If you don't use it, it atrophies. Removing your emotions from the argument, not crying, etc. Are part of that. A good way to work out this muscle without crying is to defend the opposite of what you believe, even if it's just in your head. That way you're not emotionally attached.